Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair and our indie bookstore partners, Book Passage in San Francisco, California, Boulder Bookstore in Boulder, Colorado, Gibson's in Concord, New Hampshire, The King's English in Salt Lake City, Utah, Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont, RJ Julia in Madison, Connecticut, and their sister stores in Wesleyan and East Hampton, Left Bank Books in St. Louis, Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington, and Village Books in Bellingham, Washington. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Azar Nafisi to discuss Read Dangerously, The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times, published by our friends at Day Street Books. Azar Nafisi is the author of the multi-award winning New York Times bestseller, Reading Lolita in Tehran, New York Times bestseller, Things I've Been Silent About and The Republic of the Imagination. She has taught literature at universities in Iran and the United States, was a Centennial Fellow at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and was the director of the Dialogue Project and Cultural Conversations at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Nafisi has lectured extensively on the political implications of literature and culture, as well as the human rights of Iranian women and girls and the important role they play in the process of change for pluralism and an open society in Iran. She has been consulted on issues related to Iran and human rights, both by the policymakers and various human rights organizations in the US and elsewhere. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Jackie Leiden, an American journalist and author of the memoir, Daughter of the Queen of Sheba, in 1979, Leiden joined National Public Radio as a freelance reporter in the Chicago Bureau. By 1989, she was stationed in London covering the troubles in Northern Ireland. She covered the Gulf, the Gulf War from the Middle East. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, she continued to serve as a foreign correspondent on NPR. Leiden, then living in Brooklyn, was NPR's first correspondent on the air from New York during the September 11 attacks and reported from ground zero. In late 2001, she served as a foreign correspondent in Afghanistan. As a regular substitute host for Weekend All Things Considered and other shows like Weekend Edition, she has interviewed numerous poets, authors, and filmmakers. Just a quick reminder, that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and please order your copy of Read Dangerously from your favorite neighborhood bookstore, and thank you for supporting all of us. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Azarun, it's so good to be together. This is what wonderful. We have a conversation. It's wonderful. <laughs> We're both in Washington. I want to wish you a happy Persian New Year. Happy No Roofs. Yes, I'm not. Actually, I'm at my nephew's house right now. The whole family is gathered to celebrate the Iranian New Year. And I'd love it that I will be celebrating and sharing it with you guys. I think that's a great idea. And I'm, meanwhile, in my hometown in Wisconsin. So we are both together and apart. You know, I wanted to give our audience something, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I don't think I would normally do this with even an author who was a friend, but you and I go back to some very special moments. And it was my very first trip to Iran in 1995. I believe Geraldine Brooks, the author and another friend had given me your name. Um, she might have included you in a story she did, but then I thought I'm going to go and knock on that woman's door. I was all alone in, in, in uh, Tehran. Um, and I wanted to play for our viewers tonight a little bit about our first meeting. Would that be okay? 
Yeah. Yeah. If, I hope that that uh, everyone can hear it. So this is me recording Azar at home in her apartment where you taught the students who would become the protagonists of reading Lolita in Tehran. Many of them were your university students, right? Yes. All right, here we are saying hello. The strictest Islamic dress. Bye, sweetheart. Bye. He's going to his English class. You hear that? Azar Nafisi is getting ready to go to work. Since teaching at a university is technically a government job, she has to comply with the strictest Islamic dress code. It's a reverse procedure. She's going out, so she takes her makeup off. Over here, if I um, give a lecture about revolution, uh, I wouldn't be in trouble. But if I wear lipstick, I'll be in trouble. You know, so as a woman, you know, I have to rethink and redefine myself with the values which are right now in power. So I'm thinking that might be hard for you to hear. So let me just say, you then go on to say in the very first sentence that you ever spoke to me, you say, every morning I get up and I create my reality in a void. That fiction is much more real to me than reality. And when I listened back to this piece, I, I thought, you know, your sense of reading subversively, your sense of teaching masterworks, which get us to question and have empathy and conviction. This, this just didn't, you know, start a little while ago. Uh, this is in your DNA. Well, what can I say? I mean, um, uh, ever since I was conscious of myself and my world, uh, I was brought up with uh, stories. I connected to the world through stories. I expressed myself through stories. Uh, so in a sense, uh, it did become part of my DNA, reading and writing. Well, you, this uh, book is epistolary. I mean, it is written uh, in a series of letters to your father that discuss, discusses the various authors uh, who we review here from Atwood to Hurston to David Grossman, many, you know, Plato, um, Bradbury. But in that day, when, that time when I was uh, first interviewing you, I then went to Tabatabi University where you were teaching. And you say this remarkable thing, which is in this NPR piece from 1995, you're teaching Alice in Wonderland. And you say, when Alice comes back to the world, to the word reality, she can't look at reality. She cannot look at the grass. She cannot look at the white rabbit in the same way that she has before. So there would be a power in you, which you get from fiction, which you get from that other. And with that power, once you look at your reality, you discover that things do not have to be the same way that they are now. Now I'm hearing, I was hearing that in Tehran. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Alice is my favorite reader. Uh, and that is where reading dangerously comes into play uh, because, she is by nature curious, and curiosity is one aspect of imagination. Um, Vladimir Nabokov used to say that curiosity is in subordination in its purest form. Uh, so because by getting curious, you want to go out of yourself. You want to visit people you had never visited before. You want to go to strange lands you had not been to before. And um, you might change forever uh, when you come out of those strange lands and meeting the strangers uh, that you meet. And Alice runs after that white rabbit without asking, uh, where is this white rabbit taking me? Is it safe? Would I survive if I jump down that hole after him? She just jumps down the hole. And lo and behold, what she finds out is uh, the wonderland. And that was how I felt every night when my father told me stories since I was about three and a half years old. I mentioned in Read Dangerously that um, he was very democratic in the way he told his stories. One night we would visit our um, uh, epic poet Ferdowsi and get acquainted with Persian mythology and Persian ancient history. The next night we would fly to France with Little Prince, the next night to England with Alice, the next night to, uh, to United States with Charlotte's Web, 
to Denmark with Little Match Girl. So I learned uh, as small as I was then, I learned that I can stay in my small room in Tehran and the whole world will come to me. And before I met, I came to those worlds, before I came to US or to England or to France, I had already been to the imaginary aspects of them. I had already traveled to the imaginary America before I came to America. This really speaks to me because I'm sitting mere blocks from my elementary school in yeah. Delafield, Wisconsin. And I had a different experience. At least we can say that Tehran is a world capital. I'm from a town that when I was growing up was 500 people. In this piece that we do with you, what we do to, uh, in 1995, one of your students says, the imagination is the most radical idea in any culture because you've taught that person to think like that. And I used to think that too, that stories, which you call your talismans, your houses, the places you can take with you in your mind, they're really the magic carpet. And I believed in that sense of the magic carpet too, but I didn't have a Baba. Can you tell us a little, <laughs> like him anyway? I, mean, um, I would love for our audience to know, perhaps I haven't read this yet. Your father passed away in 2004. Uh, tell us a little bit more about him. Both your parents were remarkable and had illustrious careers of their own, but your father, a former mayor of Tehran, was targeted by the opposition, well, targeted by the government and served four years in prison and refused to sign papers that would have let him get out of jail. Yes, my father was a good mayor, but he wasn't a good politician. He didn't know how to compromise with people who wanted him to do things that he deemed to be wrong. And so he was um, uh, up against two very powerful men in Iran. One was the prime minister at the time and the other minister of interior. So as you mentioned, Jackie John, um, they um, framed him and put him in what they called the temporary jail for four years without a trial. And they told him that if he says that he regrets what he did, if he apologizes, he can go free and even have a great job. But he refused to do that. He said that he wants to be exonerated and he wants to have a trial and defend himself. And finally, they couldn't do anything about him. So they had to have a trial and he defended himself and he began his defense with a poem from our epic poet Ferdowsi. And throughout his defense, he dispersed uh, uh, quotations from various poets and writers uh, the world over. Uh, and he was exonerated of all charges. At first, he was exonerated of all charges except the one called insubordination. And I loved it. I thought I was so proud of him that he uh, was not exonerated of insubordination. But later on, they exonerated him of that as well. Um, so that mm -hmm. is the one story. And these, these stories, um, you, you, this is an epistolary book. He actually wrote you letters. You two started writing letters. You started writing him letters when he went away to get an advanced degree at American University in Washington. Yes, um, the first letter he addressed to me, I was four years old and I still have the notebook he wrote in the diary um, talking to me about where we were now and how I was his hope for the future and uh, talking to me as an equal, as if I could understand everything that he was saying. And uh, he hoped that one day I will read this letter. And as you mentioned, when he went to United States to studying at the American University, I was six years old and I had just learned how to read and write. And um, we wrote letters then and we just kept on going until the day he died. We had conversations, a lot of them uh, through writing letters. When I came to America in 1997, uh, we faxed and in, uh, in uh, the fax from 
our private lives to um, Martin Luther King and Gandhi or Victor Hugo and Elwar, we, we discussed all of these things. It's a, it's a, uh, so writing letters to him for me was a very intimate act. Why did you decide that you would continue the conversation, if you will? You begin this book uh, in 2016 with letters to him. It is the beginning of the uh, Trump presidency. Uh, you are, I don't think horrified is too, <laughs> too strong a word to say. Uh, you say that in Iran, like all totalitarian states, the regime pays too much attention to poets and writers harassing and jailing them. And in, the, in America, too little attention is paid. And you, you write to your father about this idea. Yeah, I um, was sure that he would feel with me uh, the, the, the fear that I had at the direction this country was going. And I wanted to share that with him. Uh, you know, at the end of reading Lolita, I bring the quotations from Saul Bellow, who says that um, uh, in countries like Soviet Union, violence is naked. We can all understand it, they kill, you know. Um, he said that what threatens us in uh, democratic societies is our sleeping consciousness and our atrophy of feeling. And sleeping consciousness and atrophy of feeling begins with becoming indifferent towards imagination and ideas that are part of life, that express life, that connect us to life, you know. So um, I believe in the saying that says, they, first they burn books, then they kill people. Books always become indicators of where the country is going to. And today more than ever, we need to pay attention to this especially in this country. Well, we'll come back to the book bans that seem to be rampant um, before we finish this conversation. But I, I was struck when I read the book that um, in the Republic, Plato isn't tolerant of poets uh, <laughs> because you would have thought he would have loved every last one of them and gone around spouting poetry, but such was not the case. Can you explain that? Yes, that was um, uh, the interesting thing about Plato. Uh, he creates a philosopher king to rule the land. And uh, his rule is very hierarchical. Everyone, every segment of society has its place and cannot move away from that place. And uh, that kind of a mindset uh, is the beginning of a totalitarian mindset. And he can't abide the poet. He can't abide the Homeric poet. He can right. uh, tolerate those poets who um, praise uh, the philosopher king and his government and, uh, and the great heroes. But poems and poetry are too unruly for him. Mm -hmm. They bring into the, uh, uh, into the world uh, ambiguity, complexity paradox, contradictions, and uh, no totalitarian mindset can uh, tolerate that. That is why uh, they want to destroy books because um, uh, it makes you uh, want not to judge, but to understand. And uh, that is very anti-totalitarian. Well, that would certainly be true if you are, as you suggest, reading subversively, I don't want to uh, cast persons on anyone's reading habits, but we are talking about, we're talking about books that change minds. You know, we're talking about great books. We're talking about Atwood and Hurston and Ta-Nehisi Coates in here. And we are, you know, it's, these aren't beach reads. Uh, beach reads are great. I love them too. But we're talking about books that Plato himself uh, would have yeah. been uncomfortable with, it sounds like. You know, you definitely, know. <laughs> he would have been. And, and there's this contradiction at the heart of Plato because on one hand, he exiles the poet because he is too unruly and um, brings knowledge that is um, dangerous. And on the other hand, in 
another part of the Republic, uh, uh, he defends enlightenment and talks about those uh, human beings who don't want to be enlightened, who don't want to see the light. Uh, so there's that contradiction at the heart of um, uh, Plato. Well, um, I guess there's a, a bit of comfort in realizing how long that sort of blinkering has been going yeah. on. But in that case, it was just, uh, you know, blinkering, and, and you do write in here about how um, reactionary cultures cannot feel shame. And you say a totalitarian mindset is the enemy of complication. Let's talk about Salman Rushdie, because I think that for many people, um, it is now 33 years, I, I, I did my math, since the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, issued the fatwa uh, against Rushdie and the novel the Satanic Verses on Valentine's Day of 1989. And I noticed that you had an essay, a very fine one, which I highly recommend about book banning in the Washington Post on February the 14th of 2022. And I thought that, but as I was reading through Read Dangerously, which I always want to call Reading Dangerously. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> only, I do too. I only sometimes quarrel with it. <laughs> reading Dangerously. <laughs> Um, even though I intellectually knew what a hideous and violent reaction had been provoked globally, I was globally, I was based in England um, and got there not that long after the fatwa came down. Um, the furor, or as the Brits would say, the furore, the violence, the fact that uh, governments had to weigh in and whether or not to protect him, whether or not he should be given the rights of free speech, whether speech should be protected. We're seeing all of that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's remarkable. Can you just talk about why, why you spend time with Rushdie? Well, case? you know, um, it became for me a metaphor uh, for um, totalitarian mindsets versus the poetic uh, mindset. The question that I had when with the Rushdie case well, first of all, uh, I don't believe that it was an insult about Islam. Uh, it was more what Rushdie himself said that it was a critique of the West, in fact. And it was about migration, fragmentation, all the problems that we're experiencing today in the modern world. Um, so, but uh, one thing, one question that came up for me was, um, what is it? about a writer who has nothing but his, his or her pen, of course, his or her computer, uh, or, um, uh, that is their weapon, their words. And what is it about them that makes the most powerful men in the world be afraid of them? It is not only in Iran, it is in different parts of the world where poets and writers alongside of journalists have been killed because they revealed the truth. And truth is always, always dangerous because once you know it, you cannot remain silent. Once you know it, if you do remain silent, you become complicit in the crime, even the crimes that are uh, uh, created against you. Uh, so that was why I brought that case, because I wanted to open to discussion the power of, of the writer, uh, the power of words, and how much they matter, in fact. You quote him, uh, and he writes, what is free expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. And in the Satanic Verses, he writes, a poet's work is to name the unnameable to point at frauds, to take mm. sides, start arguments, shape the world and stop it from going to sleep. Stop it from going to sleep. <laughs> One side creates the noble lie to preserve order and power. The other side attempts to replace the lie with the disturbing and subversive truth. Exactly what you were just saying. And I thought, you know, this was written decades ago, but that sentence speaks to me so much now when we are facing uh, the intolerance Intolerance. Yeah. Intolerance. In uh, you know, Jackie John, I don't know. You know so much about Iran as you know about every part of other part of the world. That is uh, 
I'm, I'm always amazed by the way you become part of the cultures you go to. And that is why people open up to you and talk to you. And uh, I was wondering if I could use um, an anecdote about censorship and banning. Um, yes, uh, and, and most probably you know this. I'm not sure if you do or not. Um, uh, in Iran, uh, the head of the head censor for the theater was blind. I mean, he was literally blind and he would sit in the theater and someone would sit beside him and tell him uh, what is happening on the stage and he would um, decide to cut the parts that he has heard about. And he had told the scriptwriters and the playwrights to um, read their uh, plays into a tape and not dramatize or use any emotions while reading them. And he would listen to them and judge what he wants to cut. Now that blind censor for me became a metaphor for all forms of censorship and cancellation. Because it is not because they see you and they don't like what they see, it's because they don't even see you. They have already defined you. They don't need to know you in order to reach a definition. They want to impose their own definition on you. And that is why books become so subversive. Fiction, great fiction is democratic through its structure. I mean, the, a great writer gives voice to every single character in the book, goes under their skin. Even the villains and the people right. that the writer doesn't like get a voice. Right. So it is the most democratic form of expression. And um, no totalitarian mindset, whether living in the Islamic Republic of Iran or in the United States of America can tolerate uh, this uh, thirst for democracy. Well, it makes me wonder why certain books are constantly first on the list when it yeah. comes to books being banned. I mean, I think we we're all a little surprised by Mouse being banned by yeah. Lynn County, I think is the name of the county in Tennessee, the school board. Um, and people are trying to find all kinds of creative ways to get around that. But uh, Tony Morrison and Margaret Atwood seem to always be at the top of the list. The Bluest Eye, <laughs> Beloved, and then we go over to uh, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, you could probably give me other <clears throat> examples or hundreds of books. So we, you know, I don't want to leave anyone out, but we have to. But why do some of these, and of course it used to be that um, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer would be yeah. bad. Why are some of these classics, the first books to be teed up for literary? Why are, uh, I didn't silencing? get the last. Why sentence? are some of these books the first to come for, forward for silencing, censorship and banning? You know, Mark Twain talks about, um, uh, instructs the writers to not <laughs> say the lady scream, the old lady scream, to bring the old lady on stage and let her scream. That is what these writers do. They show you reality in its naked form. They show you reality the way you don't see it and, and uh, are afraid to see it. And, and, they, and thereby they make you disturbed. And our culture has become so complacent. The desire for comfort has uh, overwhelmed every other edge. Uh, you notice, Jackie, how many times we all say, oh, this makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to hear this because it disturbs me. Well, as James Baldwin used to say, artists are here to disturb the peace. Knowledge is disturbing. And if you cannot tolerate a book to be so naked about reality, to confront you with reality, how are you going to confront reality itself? Because life is not all comfortable. Life is not all about being complacent and uh, undisturbed. Life makes you uncomfortable and you have to be prepared for it. And one way of preparing for it is through ideas and imagination. 
and I feel my heart breaks whenever I think of our schools and system of education right now, how knowledge is becoming superfluous and ideology is re replacing the love of knowledge, the passion for knowledge. This is not democracy. Well, let me hold something up in contrast to that. The time is flying by and we have to allow space for questions. So um, it always flies when I, I know I could talk for a couple of hours. I feel like I'm already, but I wanted to just, just what you were talking about with the classroom. I met some of the students who would then become a part of reading Lolita in Tehran. And, uh, one student who is, describes himself as a devout Muslim, I don't know why I would have asked him that, somehow we got it in there, this is 1995, my first trip, who knows, uh, he said, or she said, he, and then he was joined by his, um, his wife, to judge people as to bad and good is to actually slaughter them. This is your student, and he's talking about how reading um, Nabokov and Carol and Austin have broadened his notions of morality. Everybody should have a right to a voice of his own and others should respect that voice, no matter how different that voice is. And we'll expand that to his, her, them. And this is what I found in James, how you treat other people's voices shapes your identity. Well, there you have it, you know, from, from this uh, place that we think of as repressive and then we are casually dismissed. I mean, you know, we talk about our freedoms, but how can we have freedoms if we are not uh, encouraging our, our own students to read dangerously. That is exactly the point that how can we, uh, I was thinking about the war um, uh, in Ukraine. We are talking about uh, democracy and defense of democracy. To begin with, um, we were not prepared for this assault on Ukraine because we were not paying attention to these other parts of the world. And uh, now we understand that uh, democracy in a land thousands of miles away from us, in a land where we don't speak the language of its people, where we don't know its people, democracy in that land directly and indirectly affects us. But at the same time, the question you made about parents and children, I would like to make also about this democracy. How can we be leaders of democracy in the world when we ourselves are not talking to one another? When we ourselves are not looking at freedom as an ordeal that needs to be nurtured and nourished every single day? that these rights were not God given, they can be taken away from you at the drop of an eyelid. And, and uh, you know, in some parts of the country, that mechanism has already started taking away the rights, you know? And uh, we need every reader in the world and in this country needs to think about these matters and find ways of voicing his or her concern. Well, <laughs> near the end of this book, you're actually asking readers of the world to unite and <laughs> defend their, their right to read freely. And there may have been a time when I thought that was a, you know, a noble sentiment, but we didn't need to be encouraged. And now I feel quite differently. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with, you know, it will be exciting to explore more Ukrainian fiction yeah. and poets, and um, someone can educate me on that. But I do like what you say, but despite what you said about my worldly knowledge, it, uh, it seems that um, a lot of it did not go quite that far uh, east when it came to culture. But I think that um, we see these cultural institutions being attacked. We see a place where people um, would perform, where people, and we have also seen cultural icons uh, in Russia denounce the war. And I think something really goes along with writing, of course, and reading, but also just what we talked about at the beginning, the free expression. When yeah. of all the, 
There's so we need to talk about James Baldwin a little bit more before we uh, conclude. But you know, I love your point about fiction has a multivocality, and you said we need to give the villain our voices, and we need to listen. We need safe corridors or some kind of corridor where we can actually hear one another without denouncing each other. And um, and then it made me think of The Handmaid's Tale, and you have some fun with talking about Aunt Lydia and what kind of character is she going to turn out to be? And I, I choose her because I'm hoping that people will have some familiar with The Handmaid's Tale, either from reading Atwood or from perhaps seeing the series on, on television. Um, it, it, do, do you have villains that you particularly like to think about, muse about? Well, I, I had this experience in Iran. Um, I mentioned it in Reading Lolita, where um, um, this guy who was uh, a member of the militia and uh, he had so much power, uh, one day came to the classroom and uh, poured gasoline over himself, mm -hmm. set fire to himself and started running through the corridors, shouting, look what they did to us. And um, it was a very, uh, that scene I never ever forget um, uh, when I was looking from top of the stairs at him uh, being taken down and of course he died. Uh, and they wanted the classes to go as usual, but the classes didn't go as usual. But there are two things about that. I realized something about my quote unquote enemy because up to then he was the member of militia. He had power over my life and death, never mind over my job. You know, and here he was, he was pouring gasoline over himself. I was teaching Henry James and uh, so I felt that there were things about these this pe people, individuals in the camp of the enemy that I don't know about, that I don't know the violence they're using is out of fear. And the fact that Iranian women and Iranian civil society responds not with violence, but with creative ways, finding creative ways of resisting the system shows their strength. And so, after 43 years, they have not been able to change um, our views of ourselves. You're talking about the revolution of 1979 yeah. and we met 16 years after that. Uh, it goes by very fast. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I was, I want to speak about someone I've heard you talk about before, but when I saw her name again in these pages, and that would be your student, Razier. I'm sorry, I keep coming oh, yes. to people who are so powerful for me, people whose lives were changed and who did not give that up and who paid a price for it. Yes, um, do we have time for Razier? Yes, yeah, I think so, yes. Yes, we do. Um, Razier was a student I had the first year I went back to Iran. And uh, she was um, a tiny uh, kid, I call her kid uh, woman. Uh, and uh, she, her mother was a cleaning woman and her father was dead and both her mother and Razia were religious. She wore the full hijab uh, and she belonged to an organization that was Muslim but opposed to the uh, government. Uh, I didn't know that about her then when I was teaching. And Razier uh, uh, in the, um, enrolled in the class I was teaching and she fell in love with Henry James. She loved Catherine Sloper of Washington Square and Daisy Miller of Daisy Miller. She thought that they were so independent and uh, she uh, wondered about James being a man who portray these women and their urge towards freedom so well. One day she told me, I think I'm in love. She meant with Henry James with a smile. And anyway, I left that university and I lost touch with Razier. And um, then I, um, 
uh, one day I was walking down the street and she was coming from the other side of the street. I started to talk to her, but she gave me a sign not to talk to her because it was dangerous at that time. And uh, she was being watched. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, um, uh, a while later, one other student came to visit me and she had been also to jail. And she told me that she was in jail with Razier in the same cell with Razier. And she said, you know, she talked about Henry James. I talked about Great Gatsby and his trial in your class. We had a lot of fun. And I was trying to imagine they having fun in that place. And then she paused and said, you know that Razier was executed. Well, I didn't know that she was executed. And one reason I'm telling you about this is that Razia doesn't leave me. And I decided for as long as, I, as she doesn't leave me, I will talk about her. But the question one might ask is, um, Henry James didn't uh, save Razier from death squad. She was executed anyway. So what good was Henry James to her? Henry James didn't, couldn't help her not to die, but he could help her to live. And to live right to the last moment, having fun because she has been reading Henry James. And that is what matters. We read about concentration camps. The same things happen. People reading Flaubert, um, listening to uh, music, wanting to listen to music, um, um, thinking of a painting. Uh, when we are so uh, dehumanized that we lose all our faith in humanity, when we reach that point, we turn towards those achievements of mankind that celebrate individuality, integrity, life itself, that celebrate life. And that is where why we go to imagination because it is all about life while we are alive and when we're on the edge of death. Does, um, does a totalitarian mindset, does intolerance, does this, have to be a part of our human experience? Why are we so drawn to, in some sense, interrogating the universe as humans and in others, not allowing other people to do that? Or maybe, I mean, we lead these safe prescribed ways. So um, somebody could, James Baldwin can't, you know? Yeah. It's, it goes back to Plato's rigid ideas of hierarchy and who's yeah. acceptable and what, what is acceptable speech and acceptable thinking, and then you get into labeling, and from labeling, uh, you get into dehumanizing, and from dehumanizing, you get into violent rhetoric, which we're seeing a lot of in our own political life, and pretty soon you have severe problems, and you use that word civil society. I used to think that I was illuminating. The reason I wanted to meet you was because all through the time that I reported in and out of the Middle East from about 19... 92, the final year, really, I think was 2007. I always wanted to meet artists and writers, especially writers, because such people, um, and when I say artists, all kinds of people draw, because such people had their feet in more than one world. They had that multivocality of vision. Yeah. Um, and that is why I wanted to meet you. Because I no seriously, because I knew that you would be able to explain the Islamic Republic far better than some official from the Islamic Republic could ever explain it. You know. Um, by the way, audience, we are taking your questions. I see uh, a couple beginning to come in here, and uh, don't worry, um, we will we will get to them. So please send them on in. This is what we're here for. And we want you to be part of the conversation as well on this eve of uh, the Persian New Year. Um, so why, <laughs> if in all these authors, I don't like to ask people about things like favorites, but you did say in your letters to your father that you would have liked to have introduced him to James Baldwin. 
And I just, I just like, yes, I really would have imagined it. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's just I just think they would have loved one another because my father was mesmerized by America. And uh, he actually at the end of uh, Read Dangerously in the appendix, I have his open letter to Lyndon Johnson. Yes, it's a he wrote market. a letter to Johnson when Johnson started talking about his great society. And my father was mesmerized by this contradiction at the heart of American society on one hand, it was one of the freest countries in the world, the free speech and um, uh, very prosperous. On the other hand, uh, also poverty stricken, uh, some of the worst slums in the world you can find um, in the United States and, and racism, racism really bothered him. And he kept coming back to it. And I think that with Baldwin, he would have agreed that America its future is intertwined with the future of racism, whether we'll be able to abolish it and, and uh, entertain genuine democracy or um, uh, embrace it or yeah. try to ignore it, which, which doesn't work either, you know. Uh, but, but on many other things, uh, James Baldwin was worried that he will become like his enemy. That is what I worried uh, both in the Islamic Republic and uh, during uh, the former president's uh, presidency. Um, I felt that I'm becoming like them. I become violent. I want them to die, you know, or, or would Trump... Um, I would use almost the same language he used. Mm. And, you know, Ukraine, again, is teaching us a great lesson. Putin kills children and kills um, innocent civilians. What do Ukrainians do? They call on Russian mothers to come and collect their captured sons. They don't become Putin. They kept they keep their independence, their individual integrity. And, and um, I always, in the book, I bring an example from Nancy Pelosi where um, uh, Trump used to call her crazy Nancy and all sorts of names. And once she said, I pray for him. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, how is he gonna respond to that? Because she refused that one time, she refused to go into his domain and use his language. She kept independent of that and used her own language and remained in her own domain. And that was a domain that he could not confront. That's a really interesting <clears throat> example. And you, you do have it in here. And it really goes well with um, a question that we got from Philip who says, doesn't our growing fixation on politics today impact the most on our understanding of life? Yeah. <sighs> well, are they so different though? Um, should they be? I mean, should, does politics have to be so divorced from the you know, notion of inclusion, for example? Yeah. And that's what Nancy Pelosi was really doing there. Um, she was, and just, just today, the Washington Post has an editorial about uh, violent rhetoric and it mm. finding a place in the, in the GOP and what that can do. You know, that whole notion of it can't happen here. I remember, I don't know if I ever thought like that when I was in, in Iran or other parts of the Middle East. I remember I came once after a long time abroad, I came back to Canada and Canada was going through, the, Quebec was going through a secessionist movement and people were talking so terribly about each other. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm in North America. A lot of this dehumanization can happen right here, you know? Um, so uh, anything, you know, F Philip says, uh, does it impact on our understanding of life? I, I think it does. Yeah. I think I'd have to answer that in the affirmative. Um, let's take another question. Uh, sorry, suddenly there's a, a lot of them. Um, this is more of a comment. Uh, is this reminiscent, this is chillingly reminiscent on the rise of Nazism, 
We are living in perilous times in many ways, but especially in the whole writing, reading, free expression realm. And that kind of speaks to what we've been chatting about. Yes, yes. I'm glad that you reminded us. And here is, an, is another one from Anthony. This is a call for our better angels to break down the barriers consisting of ignorance and prejudice and pave the highway full of life, love and compassion, leading to a place where all people are respected as a unique human being that they are. I like well, that. Hallelujah. I, uh, Anthony. Uh, I will, uh, you reminded me of a quotation from James Baldwin when he said, ignorance uh, allied to power is the most pernicious um, enemy of justice. Uh, so. <laughs> when I was a girl, uh, my mother, we lived on a small country road where, in fact, we still have our family home. And she used to say to me, you know, that road goes away from here, not just to here. That road goes out there and, and all your stories are out there. And I had this little newspaper uh, called The Family News that I would hand out, you know, here in town to, to pe just to people on my road. And I thought, what we need to do with children is, is get them to have the courage to think for themselves, to not, I think, um, they need to learn to ask questions. That has to, that just has to be a part of democracy, I believe. And uh, however, I think children are resilient because I'm not sure it was when I was in elementary school and I grew up to be me, <laughs> perhaps even without that. Here's another question. Oh, and this is a nice one. Um, who are the contemporary authors that provide you with hope today? You have a lovely epigram in here from Edwige Danticat, for example. Hope. I had Danticat, yes, and um, uh, I talk about uh, Tanahasi quotes. Uh, uh, he brings hope. Uh, um, there was um, the novel Americana which I loved because it was quite serious and quite fun. And um, there are a lot of, but you know, authors are, good authors are just good authors, contemporary or not, they, they are um, great authors and I'm very promiscuous when it comes to authors. I <laughs> want them all. <laughs> all right someone here wants to uh, have you talk about an essay you wrote a long time ago my students enjoyed i believe in empathy your essay they live in ephemeral digital spaces yet they impress me with their creative work do you have any advice for students based on this essay that you wrote long ago um, uh, what would the question be uh, on empathy <laughs> your essay i believe in empathy what would your advice to these students who you know how would you how do you hang on to empathy when it seems like the world is uh, trying to take it away from you the the more the world takes away from us the power of empathy the more we should empathize uh, i remember um, a quote from henry james uh, during world war one when he was uh, very much against that war and he wrote to a friend of his um, uh, that as an act of resistance, he said, feel, feel all you can. And that is what we need to do today. We need to feel, feel all we can and not wait for a disaster like the war against Ukraine to happen to feel. That is where the stories come in because we can, through curiosity, you know, you know how you read a good story, you want to follow and see what happens next, what happens next. You know, through that uh, curiosity, you reach empathy, you connect to people you should be connected to, not people who are, uh, you meet at your job or, uh, or are your neighbors, but people who share the same passion with you. And the most important thing, the most important thing through this, uh, in the stories is the fact that it gives you the power of empathy. Uh, and uh, reading for me has been the best way to empathize. 
I, I couldn't agree more. And as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, you follow the story to see where it goes. And I want to get a t-shirt that says, we are all Alice. We are all Alice. There's some really good comments here. So let me get to them from Rachel Sexton. Our nation's size and natural boundaries, boundaries, can you hear me? Have in, our nation's size and boundaries have insulated us from some of the existential threats that Europe, Asians and African nations have historically faced. How do those of us who teach students in a country like ours understand the precious value of literature to freedom? That is a very good question. Yes, that is wonderful. And um, you're right. Uh, we have become isolated uh, from the experiences of other parts of the world, uh, and in this case, Europe, um, which is why uh, we more than ever and more than others need to read to read about other people. My father was always worried that the world knows so much about America and America knows so little about the world. You know, and um, we, we need to also keep all the institutions that um, encourage this connection uh, to the world. Once upon a time, when I first returned to America, I was in love with the idea of the three um, uh, of national and the three endowments: national endowment for the arts, national endowment for humanities, and national endowment for democracy. I felt that is what a democracy should be. You know, all three of them working hand in hand, and mm -hmm. uh, that is how we should act. We should bring in art and literature and music from other parts of the world to understand the way Shakespeare, you, what Shakespeare put to us as a question, to understand the question, if you freak us, do we not bleed? Right. Because right. we all bleed. Right. We all bleed and we all have something in common, which is our common humanity. I think that we're going to take just one more question and it, this segues nicely into it. Joyce Young, I'm concerned with the devolution to there being only two points of view. I'm concerned that we're shrinking down to only two points of view, two ideas, two opinions, leaves out so many possible ways of thinking about things. Who could I suggest, I think, again, to students or friends, who might be some writers to read that we can use to open up our thinking and our conversations so that can go beyond only two ideas. Well, Joyce, do start with read dangerous <laughs> <laughs> because you will, well, you know, <clears throat> I'll just very quickly say we're running out of time. I, I was uh, reading, uh, you talked about the Israeli author, David Grossman's yes. novel, To the End of the Land. And uh, this is about the experience of a traumatized Israeli soldier and his ex-wife. And it's, it, it, I can't not wait to get my hands on it. And then countering that with Elias Khoury's um, Gate of the Sun. So you will find people that uh, perhaps, you know, you, you've only read, I mean, it's not only, but, you know, an excerpt in The New Yorker, a short story in The New Yorker. And we all, you know, we need to make reading as much a part of our life as yoga or you know that cup of tea uh, a daily voracious practice that it, it just you know imbues our souls with stretch and empathy as you say if you want to know about totalitarian mindset i would suggest hannah Arendt, which is wonderful and alongside of it if you want to know more about now um, Anne Applebaum's uh, recent, one of the most recent books of hers called The Twilight of Democracy. Yes. Uh, uh, there are many, uh, many writers. You could skip reading my book, but read the writers in the book. <laughs> um, I would like to conclude again, because it is Persian News New Year. Um, and because I, and another place that you could read, by the way, is uh, go to the website for Writers for Democracy, which is something I'm oh, a part yes. of. It's really great. And uh, we're working on uh, getting independent bookstores like all of you listening tonight to help register voters uh, for the coming 
election, of course, authors and voting and thinking all go together. So it's a very exciting project to be involved with. And you will read many essays on that website that go exactly to what we're speaking about, including authors from Eastern Europe. Please support your bookstores. <laughs> and your book Nothing, I book. mean, the feel of a book in your hands, the, the, the pages, the touch, the, the, it is a sensory experience. Please support your bookstores and your library, please. Oh, would you like okay, me to well, read? I, I feel like I was called in at that moment. Oh, okay. Very good. In <laughs> at that moment. Thank, Please thank you so much, Christy. Oh my gosh. Thank you both. What a wonderful, wonderful conversation. So amazing. And, and yes, uh, booksellers and artists are here to disturb the peace. And I really, really just loved your emphasis on how books help us to live and how it all comes back to individuality and the integrity of that individuality. I, I think that was just so, so beautiful. So thank you. Thank, thank you both you. for joining us. Well, we, we thank you and, and also Books and Books, which has been so instrumental to Writers for Democratic Action and this wonderful conversation, which ends, and I didn't get to read my Shauna line, so people will just have to- Why go. don't you do it? Do it. Okay, I'll do it. It's, you don't have to well, Do you want to do it, Osar? You write, you are quoting Ferdowsi, Ferdowsi, the poet uh, of Iran, ancient Iran, who wrote the King of Kings, the Shahnameh, it's a myth epic. I've reached the end of this great history and all land will fill with talk of me. I shall not die. These seeds I've sown will save my name and reputation from the grave. And men of sense and wisdom will proclaim when I have gone my praises and my fame. He predicted well. And Vladimir Nabokov said, governments come and go, only the trace of genius remains. So. All right. Wonderful. I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you to Miami Book Fair for your partnership. Thank you to all the independent bookstores who worked with us today to make this event possible. And um, I wish we could go on for another couple of hours, but uh, read the book, read dangerously. Remember to keep reading dangerously all the time. And, um, and we'll see you, hopefully, we will see all of, we will be together in person soon, I hope. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Asar Thank, Thank you. you very much, Christy. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Keep reading.